Clay, this is a little bit disconnected from what we're going to talk about, but Mm -hmm. uh, I posted a story in our Discord channel about uh, from Vice.com about someone who has been for 36 years trying to convince William Shatner that he is his illegitimate child. And apparently the uh, Maury-esque paternity results came back and proved that he is not actually related to uh, Mr. Shatner. Uh, even though he changed nice his try. name, he changed his name to Shatner. It didn't work. <laughs> he did yeah. the DNA test. But um, his my favorite part of this, besides the fact that the guy seems like absolutely uh, Looney Tune, is that he he's like, I never met my father, and uh, when I was a kid growing up, I asked my mother who my father was, and she said, Well, it's either <laughs> it's either William Shatner who played Captain Kirk on Star Trek, or it's a guy named Chick, who I'm not sure what his last name was. That was, <laughs> that was the response. And then it goes through that. And then at the end of the mm-hmm. story, he goes, actually, when I did the DNA test, I actually found out who my real father was. And he was neither of those guys. He was just an insurance salesman that lived near us uh, in the whatever, the 60s or whatever. So it was. Oh. I was just thinking, imagine asking your mother who your father is. And she goes, it's either a movie star or a guy named Chick. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> and then it turns out to be neither of those two and it's just some guy who sells insurance yeah i mean i guess he split the difference on that one yeah at least uh, at least he got the law of averages seems to right have a, uh, that's the law of average job. yeah <laughs> that reminds me uh, uh on one episode i think of badass sean was talking about a a documentary about the a guy who dresses up as superman um like outside in california or something and how he thought that he was the illegitimate son of christopher reeve mm-hmm. and it just turned out that he was just mentally ill yeah. so that seems that seems to be the the way of things at this point <clears throat> good good on that guy though the shatner guy for committing to the bit i mean you know that seems like one of those things where you stick with it long enough you get some sort of out of court settlement or something yeah i, I would recommend people uh, I don't know if I'll retweet it or put it in this thing, but go to the uh, the Discord to read this article. It's just like he he's clearly not all together because he mm-hmm. has some story about meeting Shatner, and he says that Shatner denies ever meeting this guy, and then he says, after me and Shatner spent uh, the night crying together and reminiscing, I got a call the next day from someone who sounded very much like a lawyer. That, that was his quote. He goes, he sounded very much like a lawyer. <laughs> so, I think... Um, Usually lawyers will make themselves clear what they're uh who they're representing and stuff like that. It's that not could so just be some like that could just be some like low level anti Semitism coming out. Could I don't be. Know. Yeah. He had a he had a real New York accent and was talking about shekels and I just didn't want to deal with it. Um that's it. We're gonna I, I was trying to delay it, but we're gonna talk about the sanctuary. We're gonna take a break. We're going to play a clip from this episode, and then we'll come back and we'll break it down. I am Kaihim, store of the century. Oh, some job you're doing. Looks like the price of transfer meat has hit a new high. I'm Commander Michael Burnham of the Starship Discovery. Direct didn't mention... Book. Book. I stopped being a Terex when father and grandfather started working with the Emerald Chain. And they both asked for you under death bets. You're a man of character. Or you aren't. Maybe they remember that in the end. Oh, so righteous. Someone has to be. All right. The Sanctuary is the eighth episode of the third season of Star Trek Discovery, first aired on December 3rd, 2020, written by Kenneth Lynn and Brandon A. Schultz, directed by Jonathan Frakes. In Universe Date 3189, we can't get any more specific than that. In this episode, Burnham and the USS Discovery crew travel to Book's home planet to help rescue it from Osira, the formidable leader of the Emerald Chain. Meanwhile, Stamets and Adira continue their search for valuable information on the origin of the Burn. Capital B. Clay, I always start off talking about these things, and maybe it becomes monotonous for people. So why don't you start this one off? <laughs> that, that tells me that you don't have a much to say and b much kind things to no, say. No, I don't have much kind things to say. I'm scared. Um. Yeah i i don't I don't know about this one. It, um. The thing that threw me off in this episode was for a show like Star Trek, which has a long history of covering their lack of production value, or I should say the the amount of money they have for a production in various methods of uh, ingenious production value. I'm surprised this is where you're going, honestly. But go, but go ahead, yeah. Well, it was it was the it was the the number one thing that stood out to me is that. They live in a 70s lounge 
on this it's, one. It's like it's like <laughs> someone's living room. <laughs> Not only is it like, is it just like it was probably Frakes' house, honestly. I know. Like, honey, he's, <laughs> it's always the, 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 was the um the real ripe and real rotten where um Ridley Scott did the movie because he lived down the street from the place. Oh the yeah, the uh, the a perfect year. Perfect or whatever year. The hell. <laughs> yeah, like so. Not only is like the 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 clothes that everybody wears in that planet like smoking jacket robes, kimono kind of, like, kimono like, slash bathrobe is the way I would describe comfortable it. bathrobes. They go to the planet and they do the uh, the number one sign of we don't have any money, which is they do a bunch of scenes in the woods. And then you don't see a city or anything. You they see just no cut people. To like, you see literally no that? no one on this yeah. planet except he, for the bodyguard and the guy. Yeah, yeah, f- five guys, five people. Um, and then they cut to where they're going, and I'm, and I'm like, okay, well, they're gonna go to some interesting place at least. Nope, it's just like the living room of like a mod- like a moderately futuristically designed house, mm-hmm. and it stood out so much to me as not having any sort of like uh the guy has with anything. the guy has a chandelier it is it's like they point it out <laughs> they point out the chandelier and say and like point it out as being some like mystical <laughs> thing or something and i'm like that's just a chandelier yeah it's like it didn't even they didn't even dress the house no and on top of that they're doing all this talk about about the people and the society and you see none of that um and then they don't <laughs> and then he's like the thing where they just talking about his family. You don't see the family. I guess you see his son at the end, but it's just yep. like it. It, it they was start the most... bombing the planet and they are shooting the forest where no one is, and he's yes! and he's devastated by it. And it's yeah. not even hitting the forest; it's hitting like a shield or some shit. <laughs> um, and it, I was just like, "What is going on? Why do I care about any of this stuff?" Uh, they get these blue floaty things that look kind of cool, but ultimately. Apparently, if you just ask them really nicely, yeah. they go away. Yeah, yeah. See you, the, the thing, the thing that actually made me say "fuck you" to the TV, which on this show I tend not to do that much, but the thing that made me do that was when they're were and they're on the ground, book and uh, Michael. T- you are, mean T Rex? <laughs> T Rex. Book, book's name is Trex, which is just oh, T apostrophe Rex. I was I didn't even I was following that shit. <laughs> uh, they're running. They're running around. And uh, uh, what the fuck is it? Detmer is flying around in book ship. Book looks up into space and says, is that my ship? (laughs) He looks into space and sees a ship that is about the size of a pinhead compared to Cyrus ship, which you can kind of see through the atmosphere, which I also call bullshit on that. It's way too big. Yeah, yeah. But even on top of that, like you can't see an airplane <laughs> flying thirty thousand feet up in the sky. How the fuck are you going to see a a, a a spaceship? Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. I don't know why I focused on that. Maybe there was nothing just because there wasn't anything else for me to really get it. I I didn't hate the entire thing. I thought yeah. I thought Saru trying to find a, a catchphrase was fun. I like that. Saru trying to find a a catchphrase is. I think it's one of those storylines I would have more patience for it if my time otherwise was not being wasted by the show. Yes, yeah, like, yes. you know, if, if if this show is ticking along and I, they're just like, we're going to have an episode where Saru has a lighthearted, I'm going to find a catchphrase. I'd be like, that's fine. Here, it's just uh, insults on injury, really. It's mm. like, this is this is bizarre. That uh, It's maybe not bizarre, but it's like, it feels too... It feels a little bit too outside of the show. It's the show being aware that it's a show, and I don't really like that on shows that are not set up that way. It doesn't feel like it's it's cute or uh, good writing to stay that way. It um, is. It is. It does kind of continue the trend of being oddly self aware and meta this season, yeah. though. There was some other scene that happened in this one that was very meta and self aware. Uh, I cannot remember what it was. I was going to bring it up. I can't remember off the top of my head, but. Um, yeah, you went for the production, which I think is one way to go at this show. I, uh, I, I had a um, interaction on Twitter earlier, which was funny in that sometimes I get in the moods where I actually like respond to people on Twitter, and if I respond to you, uh, just blame Twitter the fact that Twitter puts likes that other people are have in my timeline now, so I see stuff that I should not be seeing, and then I get annoyed by it. Um, mm. 
but it was someone just talking about like the depth of the Romulan Vulcan storyline. And mm. I just retweeted them saying like, there was no depth to this storyline. And they responded to me and they said, well, wait until they do more with it. And it's like, <laughs> if they do, it's not going to be anything. The Detmer and Adira storylines are why my opinion is correct about this fact, right? right? Like they, sure. there is two stories that seem to come to a close in this episode. And I'm not even sure they were actually intended to be stories. It seems like it's an accident that they became stories somewhere along the line. Detmer's post-traumatic stress disorder is apparently mm. only post-traumatic stress. And there's nothing else going on. They just set it up very strangely where you thought something was happening with her, but it's not. It's just something. And then Adira's storyline is more strange to me, but we'll, we'll, we can get to that. I would just get to Detmer's first, which is, this is Discovery Storytelling. They brought something up and they're going to close it with no thought about what it is. It just happens. And there's no, there's not even a traceable path of what this character went through that caused them to learn something right. about this. Right. It's just, she apparently had post-traumatic stress. She got in the ship and was like, oh shit, I'm flying for real now. And, and then the blue guy is like, I'll fire the guns. <laughs> and that's the end of it. What's it's that the, story? What's the point of that story? It's kind of a throwback to what I was saying about the Superman story a few days ago, where it's like, she has post-traumatic stress disorder and she beats it by flying harder. Yeah. That's about it. Like, there's not... They didn't have time to do anything else with it. It doesn't really affect her. And now it seems to be over. The Adira one, I don't think the Adira story is over yet. I don't think that's over. No, I don't think... Well, um, not. I think that the, 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 the point of this um, gender reveal is over. And that ties into the Detmer sure. thing, which I think is... I don't understand why they chose to do the Adira story that way, where there was a, this is a sci-fi show, right? Mm -hmm. So the point of doing sci-fi is that you can put stories and narratives into another context to create an allegory for things. Mm -hmm. And what they did here is they inserted a non-allegorical story, which is extremely modern but in a way that it makes no sense in the context of the show. And I don't understand why you did it when you have a Trill character who's doing that. Like the point of the Trill is designed to carry stories like that, to carry a sort of like feeling different than what you look on the outside, basically. Like you, you are, mm -hmm. your, your internal life is different than your exterior life. And Adira has a storyline where in the future from now, a problem that we are currently dealing with is a non-factor, right? There's there's no there's no reason to believe that this is still a problem in the Star Trek universe. So mm -hmm. when she brings it up and is like, I've been so ashamed, or they when they bring it up and they're like, I'm so ashamed to to say this, or not ashamed, but I've been so embarrassed and so unsure about what to say, but I, I prefer to use a different pronoun. And then Stamets goes, yeah, okay. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah. what, the, what the, who, like, well, how is this a problem? The, the thing that's interesting is not about whether or not you do it. And then it ends in a, almost like they're like taking the shit out of it. Where it's like, hey, is they over there? Hey, they, is that they over there? They, 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 they. And it's like. That was a bit much, yeah. There's no, this is a sci-fi show. Make it an allegory about something. Mm -hmm. Why are you just, I don't, and it's not that anyone needs to care or think that it's wrong or like that it's like good to be doing it or that there's any kind of problem with this kind of storyline. The issue is that they're not even cloaking it in some kind of narrative to go along right. with it, to make it interesting. And at that point, it makes no sense contextually with where the show is supposed to be, what the Star Trek universe is supposed to represent, where this would not be a big deal in the future. It's Gene Roddenberry's thing about Picard. They're like, well, how can... Why haven't they cured baldness in the future? And Gene Roddenberry goes, well, no one cares in the future. So yeah. why would they do it? <laughs> I don't understand that story. That's Discovery's storytelling problem in a nutshell is that they they gave it to the Trill character. They they, they gave it to the yeah. Trill. It's like the only one who can do that story and they, they just fuck it up. Well, and it's also strange to me because it was not an issue beforehand either. Like it's not, it's the not pronoun, like it's something. The pronoun thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like something they've been building to or anything. Uh, it's just, it's like the tag on the end of the scene where they're like, ah, you know, by the way, could I, could you, could you say they instead? Like, yeah, no problem. 
<laughs> I, and, I know, and yeah. I, but the emphasis they put on it is so weird because they are acting as though it has been a character struggle for them up to this point or something, which it hasn't. At right. least, let's put it this way. We have not seen it. They have not sure. shown it to us in that way. Um, which I think you can link through the Trill thing. The, the they pronoun can be used as a metaphor for a non-Trill who's not used to being joined, accepting that they are now something else. You know, like sure. the, that, or that society does not recognize what they truly are. You know, like that kind I mean, of a thing. I thought, I, I thought uh, when they were talking about how Every day they wake up and they're not sure which one they're, which person they're going to be, which personality is going to be the strongest. I thought that was really interesting. I thought that would that's a really that would have been a really interesting way to go with the trill because they've never really done that before. Like right. Dax has always been Dax, you know. Yeah. Um, they Gen Z uh, and Dax. It's always been the the, yes. the Dax that you're you're used to. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. She's uh, she's every now and then will be like, oh, I remember Curzon or I remember blah blah blah, but. But she's always just Dax. Yep. Um, and to to describe the trill as never knowing what sort of personality influence you're going to wake up with, and how that makes you feel detached as as your own person, I think that's really interesting. Um, but they kind of just sideswipe that in favor of whatever this is, I guess. And I, it's just there's no yeah, conflict. A, there's no conflict yeah, to the it's story. Zero conflict. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, and you know, it's that the the outcast episode from TNG gets a lot of flack now because it is dated. But it was like it was a '90s show trying to approach a is like that homosexual. the one where Riker falls in love with yeah the, with a, a genderless okay. or female or the, her species is genderless, but she is turning female. So there's like this kind of like con sure. or male or something. But there's this homosexual undertone to it, um, or overtone in a lot of sense in a lot of ways. That um. That does the thing right that dresses a a a narrative or cultural um zeitgeisty thing in a story that is mm. sci fi around it, and it's not that you're disguising the issue or that you're like, well, it's too embarrassing to talk about the actual issue itself, so we're just going to like dress it up in a way that you know stupid people won't understand what we're talking about and we can get get around them. Uh, this is the, mm-hmm. what I'm saying is that the argument of like a producer's mind would be. It's not that. It's just that the the reason you do a sci-fi show is because you can dress things up that way. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, just make a drama and just right. call it like a modern day thing. Well, but the, I, I think that's the problem with this show in general is... I hate to be one of these people because this sounds very over overarching, but <clears throat> Star Trek Discovery does not seem interested in telling sci-fi stories. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just doesn't. They'll put sci-fi trappings on stuff, sure. But Techno very Babel rarely, is an occasional episode. Yeah, everything. The, the settings are very sci-fi. Yeah, but very rarely are they telling a science fiction story. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that's where your mileage will vary. If, if it's if you prefer this kind of detached character stuff with a sci-fi veneer, then I guess this show is for you. But if you're yeah. looking for a sci-fi show, this isn't it. Yeah. I guess I I guess the argument for me would just be you're not embracing like if you're choosing to make this a genre show like that, you have to embrace what makes that strong in it. It's like right. if you're like, I'm gonna paint a picture, but all I have is clay. It's like, well, maybe don't point a, paint a picture. Yeah, unless you can paint it for them. All you have is uh, sculpting I, yeah, clay. Yeah, in that situation, in that situation, you do have a leg up because <laughs> I do know how to paint. So, <laughs> if if you have um, if you want to paint and all you have is a chisel and a rock, you might not be, it might not be a painting. Is the thing that you want to do right. Right at that point? You right. might you might want to do something else. And I would be more forgiving of this flaw if what they were doing was not exactly. Uh, dependent on the genre, but was actually interesting or good, or mm-hmm. if it was terrible, but I at least was like, this is a good effort of trying to do something that is just simply not not really working. Uh, and it's not that. That's not the case. I 
I just th- I, I think about back just about that response, and I, I find a lot of people defending the show with a a look to the future of saying, well, they're going to do this, like they have to link it eventually. It, it's sure. the same reason why everyone is like, well, just wait until they expose the mystery of the burn. And then you're going to be like, well, I felt like an idiot for doubting the the genius of this show that something was ever going to go wrong. This show has never, to my memory, ever paid off something satisfyingly. Mm. I've never been like, wow, that's a that's a good conclusion to that story. It's always this like limp dick, pointless. You're you're almost surprised the story is over. You're like, really? They're just, just going to wrap it up? I thought things were just getting started. We, I mean, how about we diagnose what the problem is? How about we diagnose what someone's internal struggle is? And no. And you, the same thing applies to book story here. My Honestly, I'm, I'm glad that you felt that you can't explain anything. My eyes and brain just shut down when Book and his brother were talking to each other. It's like, I don't, I don't yeah. give a fuck. None of this is going to matter at <laughs> all <laughs> about <laughs> anything. And I couldn't tell you why they were fighting with each other. Or... Are they even brothers? Uh, yeah. I don't know. They speak a different <laughs> accent and they look very different from each other. Well, that was very confusing too because when when they're doing their hallway walking scene where he's ex- expositorying uh, what's going to happen with his, with his family, he says his brother and then she says something like, I thought you didn't have a brother. And he says, well, it's not, a, not by relation. It's just kind of like something we say. But then later on, he starts making jokes like, well, it runs in the family and stuff like that. And it's like, <laughs> this is, I don't know what's going on. It looks like Kenneth uh, Lynn and Brandon Schultz might have had a disagreement when they were passing their drafts back and forth about whether or not yeah. this is actually a brotherly relationship. It, late And later on, Burnham makes reference to Book's nephew. And it's like, okay, so it's, <laughs> it's like the... <laughs> It's like the modern equivalent of that great scene from Dawn of the Dead when they're flying off in the helicopter and uh, Ken Furry is like, I had, I lost a lot of my brothers out there. And then I forget the, the woman's name, you know, the mousy white woman. She goes, do you mean real brothers or street <laughs> brothers? And Ken Furry just goes, both. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's true racial compromise right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, there's 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 a lot going on that kind of crystallized for me at this point of me just like my eyes rolling so far back into my head. I don't un- I still don't understand why it took discovery to find out all of this stuff about the burn that apparently was super easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like apparently, all you needed was two black boxes from blown up ships, and which which is a yeah. Think about what this means, right? The black box is the equivalent of it's not even equivalent. It is a black box. Imagine if we had two plane crashes, or all the planes crashed in the world, and a mm-hmm. hundred years later, someone came by and says, "Did you guys go find the black boxes?" You go, "What?" <laughs> it's the first thing you do. When the yeah. plane crashes, you find the black one. That's the whole point of the reason the thing is designed for. It makes no yeah. fucking sense. And all you need is two of them. You don't need, like, all of them. No, just <laughs> two. <laughs> Imagine you're the Federation, right? Yeah. You've probably got, like, a handful of these ships that have blown up within impulse range of where you are. You yeah. could probably get a whole bunch of those black boxes. No problem. And then on top of that, all you need to do is triangulate it with the information that we still don't even really know what the information was that they got from the Vulcans. Yeah. But the, whatever the, it was. It's just the MacGuffin of the data. That yeah. They need. Yeah. They, this, this, uh, it, mini disc that they got from, from the Vulcans triangulates it to tell them, well, we know where it started. Like, oh, okay, cool. And it's singing, I guess. Sure. Uh, I like the idea of there. I like the thing of there being a ship, a distressed ship. That they a go sure. Yeah. Yeah. That it's going to be the fine. discovery. Right. Ooh, it's going to be, you think so? It's going to be time travel shenanigans that causes Giorgio to go back into the time. The discovery is the ship from Calypso because that was lost in a nebula when that guy finds it. Oh, it, really? It's going to be some kind of time travel thing. I guarantee it. Yeah, because they still need to get her off the ship so she can go back to Section 31, right? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> um, and then what was the shit? What was the other thing? Oh, then the, they have this whole story of the episode is you finally meet fuck what the hell is her name i said it once already in the episode but i already forgot osira you finally meet osira who uh is you find you know that she's mean because she killed her own nephew 
And then she wants the Andorian guy back, and the Andorian guy comes to the bridge, and Saru's like, you need to tell me why she wants you so bad. He's like, I can't do that. And they go through this long thing, and they end up you know, taking the ship out, blah, 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 blah. Osira just decides to fuck off eventually. And then the, the Andorian guy pulls Detmer aside at lunch and is like, the reason that she wants to kill me. Tells I'm Tilly, sorry, Tilly, right? He tells Tilly. Tilly, yeah. The reason she wants to kill me is because I know she's running out of dilith- dilithium. It's like that's it, and, and but then he dramatically goes, and now, and now I told you. Know. you. <laughs> that's <laughs> he goes, now- That's the whole thing. <laughs> she's she's embarrassed that she's running out of dilithium. That's that's it. <laughs> I think so. Now, yeah. If we had a better understanding of what that meant for this shadowy character, we've only just now met, and nothing wrong with this in concept. Like, nothing wrong with this in concept. But they, he does not no. explain what that means. What that yeah, what that it means, means. It means nothing. I mean. I don't like if she's I guess if she's got a bunch of dilithium she's got she could travel at warp speed and whatnot clearly so I guess if she runs out of dilithium then she doesn't have the power to control these planets and stuff yep. but that's never expl- that's never explored or anything her it's empire such is, a- is not her, her empire is not explored I mean like was she's- it supposed to be like a big reveal that she has warp capabilities i don't i didn't get that impression i i get the impression that some people still have warp so but you know it's i don't feel like this is a i thought i thought that was the thing is that there were people who still had warp capabilities it just wasn't like everybody or something but Um, she's been she's been obviously harvest or that doesn't even really make sense because it's her black market that that was selling dilithium in the first episode right so they're just selling right stuff it's not like she's right it's not that she's hoarding it and is like, I'm going to grow my Holy Roman Empire through seizing all the resources and basically mm-hmm. being the only person who can do that. They seem to be selling it. And I don't know. I, I thought I thought just I thought she sucks as a villain. I, I yeah, hate the sad. Orion makeup where they're like, let's make them look like wax people. <laughs> yeah, that's real. Well, there was, you know, I noticed there was a lot of ADR in this episode. Was there? Yeah. It, yeah, I could tell a lot of George Ao's early scenes were all ADR'd. A lot of the scenes were ADR'd. Saru's stuff was ADR'd. Did they um, ADR the George Ao line where she said, I look like a sperm? <laughs> they might have. <laughs> um, and the uh, Osiris stuff was ADR too. I don't know if it's a problem with the makeup. The makeup. Maybe they always do it that way. Yeah. And, it, and this time it was just bad. And it, maybe they rushed it or something. I don't know. But I thought it really stood out. They're, they can't move their faces in that that makeup. Right. I, don't, I don't understand right. what the point of it is. Um, yeah, I, she's just a nothing burger villain. It's it's you know it's it's one obstacle to stand in the way of discovery. But I don't get a sense of how her villainy is tying into anything about the Federation. Uh, it can, like state mm. of mind at this point. They're just randomly bombing forested planets. <laughs> And looking for stuff it's just no there's no sense of scope or how all of this is linking together and i was just i read a lot of reviews that said that this episode was the episode that pulled all the plot threads together of the season and i don't i mean kind of i guess <laughs> by linking what osira and the emerald chain to i mean it reveals information about all the plot threads but it's not yeah. they still feel as my, my point is that they feel as disparate and separate and unconnected as they ever did and this yeah. didn't do anything I, to alleviate that. So we are at, are we over the halfway point at this point? We, we are, right? Yeah, there's 13 the episodes. So we're at eight. Yep. yep. We're at eight. Okay. So we're over the halfway point. We're only just meeting what I have to assume at this point is going to be the main antagonist for the rest of the season. I have no idea what her scope is. I have no idea what she's capable of. I don't know why any threats she makes towards the Federation hold any water. Like, I, I don't, there's nothing foreboding or threatening about this character. And so, like, it just seems like a nuisance they have to deal with yeah. in on the road to finding out this stuff about the burn. And, like, if, if she's, if they're setting this up that Osira is going to be, like, the big bad for the rest of the season, I don't really, like, they could have at the very least cast a more charismatic actor. <laughs> She's a bad actress. She feels like she, she feels just like a normal person who is dressed up yeah. in that makeup to deliver lines. Yeah. 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 Like I, I was thinking at least 
at least when they cast Eric Bana as Nero, he kind of yeah. like made some choices. Oh, like, same with yeah, um, I know I know you I know you hate it, but I I love that first scene where he pops up on the screen and he's like, "Hi, Christopher, I'm Nero." <laughs> like just it's just a weird line reading. It is a, a weird. Bit of, it is a weird reading. I mean, he he did imbue it with personality. I would, yeah. I would say the the more obvious thing would be someone like gowron right where robert riley if you look at the gowron performance out of anything you're like this guy is going insane with this performance mm-hmm. like this is completely over the top but he he brings gowron to life in a way that is unlike any other klingon character and you're just like oh that's the gowron performance or whatever and it, it feels like it belongs hers is just she's just totally deadpan she's like yeah you guys came for the dilithium i don't know about that captain saru haven't seen a federation ship in a while it's like she's just reading this off the off the board or something and i'd much rather have eric banna saying hi chris my name is nero than this <laughs> yeah it's like she's i feel like if you want to if you want to position that character to be a threat you need someone who can brought who can if you're not going to really really give us an idea of how or why she's a threat you need someone who can do that through their performance, and she didn't do it. Yeah, it would be my uh, my counter to Sean Murphy's doesn't like the uh, the Bane performance in The Dark Knight. Where oh, totally, yeah. My, no, my counter would be mind. the Bane performance is the only thing that I remember about Bane because his plot kind of yeah. sucks in that movie. So it's like you have to you have to give all credit due to Tom Hardy for making it a character that I actually remember uh, because of mm-hmm. that. Um, it's the same for Asira. It's. I don't have a lot to say about the planet stuff uh, because, as I said before, I don't, I didn't really pay attention to what was going on, and it seems like you I don't, didn't lose anything by not paying attention to what that is. Did they you, beam all the fireflies off the planet at the end? Is, is no, how? no. What they did was, um, oh, all of the scientists have spent a hundred years trying to get these sea locusts to go back into the ocean, but they just, they just can't figure it out. So uh, finally, they, they, uh, Michael realizes that if Book and his brother combine their empathy powers and combine that with the discovery magnifying the electromagnetic blah 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 yeah. yep. wavelength of these things, they have enough broadcasting power to, to get to, to reach all of the locusts and ask them nicely to go back into the water. <laughs> That's it. The power and, uh, of the power of it's another thing about how the power of love and friendship is more powerful than right. Science. They 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 really need Mowgli from uh, Captain Planet. Is that is that his, or what's his name? No, Mowry, right? Mo- or Mowgli? I don't remember. Mowgli is the Jungle Book. Mowgli is the Jungle. It's uh, I don't remember the Captain Planet character. Captain Planet. This is what we're doing. We're we're actively live googling <laughs> Captain Planet character names. It's so uh, much we enjoyed this Mati 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 Mati. Yeah. <laughs> hey, let's start podcasting made, about Captain Planet. <laughs> everybody, every one of us who made fun of that character as children because they were like, "Heart is the dumbest ring," <laughs> is really getting a face full of pie at this point. Because every every episode of every show now is about how heart will always is the only. It's the only ring. Yeah. Uh, Until what's his name with the fire ring shows up and torches Wheeler, his ass. Wheeler, Wheeler, the fire, the fire. They use their rings surprisingly little in that show. Honestly, it was it's really surprising how little they use their powers. Um, although last because they're Planet crazy Point. powers. Yeah, they're teenagers and they have these. One of them has like the power to make earthquakes happen yeah. and shit. It's like you don't. <laughs> you, the 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 real version of Captain Planet is they never get around to summoning Captain Planet because they end up destroying the world themselves by accident because of their, you know, this immense power given to dumb teenagers from the Model UN. Captain Planet has my second favorite character name in terms of it being so bad of a pun. It's great, which is Luton Plunder is the name of the, the oh, one of the villains, yeah. which is a great name. Second only to. Uh, Miles Prower, which is Tales from Sonic the Hedgehog's name, Miles Prower, which is Miles Prower, <laughs> turned That's into an English. <laughs> I always liked, uh, there was a cartoon when we were younger called Cops, mm-hmm. where all the cops were like cyborgs and shit. Um, it was this weird. An acronym, right? One. It's C dot O yeah, dot C-O. P. Yeah. Yeah. It was this weird like RoboCop, like a, f- a more kid friendly RoboCop thing. And one of the villains was named Miss Demeanor. Mm-hmm. And she was. <laughs> She was just a lady villain named Misdemeanor. I was I was always tickled by that. 
I my my favorite one of those is uh, there's an episode of Robot Chicken where they're doing He Man, mm-hmm. and uh, I think it's the the villains are stuck in traffic in a car or something, and then Evil Lynn speaks up and says, "Evil Lynn will blah blah blah." And Skeletor goes, "I thought your name was Evelyn." <laughs> Did, um, why are we making fun of this discovery solution when it seems out of context, a very Star trek solution? Um, I'm laughing at it, at least. Maybe you're not laughing yeah. at it. I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Because, yeah, it doesn't, it's not like I, I don't feel like it's that out of place for an episode of TNG or something for them no. to do something like this. The focus on I, hearts might be. The focus on it being like yeah. just... I I think it's the same as anything. It's the 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 solution seems born out of nothing. You know, yeah, it's like it is, if yeah. that if that had been they're lucky that they even foreshadowed that book has this power because I could see a discovery plot line where they're like, "Oh, yeah, we have the power to talk to animals is the reveal right at the end." That they're, they're, they're like, "We should just do it." And the discovery's like, "We'll amplify it with our megaphone deflector dish." And you go, "Okay, that's mm-hmm. that's Star Trek, I guess." It's um I just don't understand what that that storyline is saying. What what it, like what is the larger point it's trying to make there about reconciliation or just ask people nicely to do something or environmentalism? I it's like I, I honestly have no idea well, what's supposed to be happening. I think it's because the plot that leads up to it it's it is supposed to be this sort of reconciliation working together with your family blood is thicker than water kind of thing right matches the theme of rebuilding the federation on a macro level of the season except that the story that gets you to that point is like barely existent he shows up back on the planet because because this stuff is happening but we don't get any sense of the context of the locusts overrunning anything because the locusts are presented as this harmless, beautiful thing. Yeah. They're everywhere too. They're just like a a constant. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you you don't see them causing any damage. And then when he's talking to his brother, his brother's the scene of the villages running in terror from a cloud of those things just coming over and like eating all the food and then floating off. Yeah. Or something, anything. And when he starts talking to his brother, they start like talking, uh, talking in, uh, very uh abstract ways about family disputes and then from there it turns into the fact that uh his brother lured him there i think yeah for, for osira was, for osira to get the andorian because, i think yeah, because <laughs> she wants the andorian and it's like this doesn't track at all mm-hmm. like i would if this was him going back there to deal with his his home planet and osira tracked them there or something i would believe that more but it's just this weird like blackmail extortion thing and it's like well if we don't if i don't give her if we don't give her the andorian she's going to destroy the planet and it's it just doesn't have anything for you to grab onto that makes the end of that episode matter at all really we can wrap it up soon. Why'd they do the Detmer story? What is this story? Uh, just getting over PTSD. It, I guess they had, it feels like they had to do it. So they did it and they got it over with. Are you talking like larger scale? Like why did they put this across multiple episodes or just specifically why did they end it this way? I I'm confused about every aspect of the story. I don't know why they set it up as though she had been mentally taken over by something where she gets in the crash and is then like looking around and like everything looks different. And she's, she's, yeah, I think that's, that's up for, I don't, I don't, I think it only looks that way if you're looking for that. I don't think that was ever the intention. Why is it so sudden? Is the, is the question like they, the, the way they play it is she never portrays anything like this until that event happens. So you go, Oh, the event must've caused something to happen, but yeah, it I think it was a concussion. It's the, so the concussion gave her PTSD. Is that what we're supposed I, to be? I think, yeah, I think it was a combination of, of the, the event of the finale of season two and the jump into the future and, and smacking her head fucked her up pretty good. That's it. What is the 
I I can see the I can see the pitch for this in the in the room being like we've never really seen a Starfleet member with PTSD before or shell shock or something. So why don't we what if we do that? What would that look like? And you're like, yeah, what would that look like? And then nobody bothered to finish that sentence. I I would argue I would argue the opposite. I would say that um trying to do this again is like the way that the way that it's appropriate to do this is that the traumatic event is powerful, interesting and shown previously. So I would point to Picard's recovery from the Borg attack and family is the show oh, sure. dealing with yeah. PTSD. Sure, sure. But he also indirectly killed 11,000 people in that which gave him a kind of like gravitas to the problem and it's this character who's always been portrayed as this beacon of whatever and he's like and he's cracking under it here it's just i just come back to the dinner. she's stressed about flying the ship it's like i don't mm. i don't understand what you, that's your fucking job it's like the mailman being like i can't deliver all these mail letters it's like what did you sign up <laughs> what did you what did you sign up for here and it's not like the mailman is getting post-traumatic stress from being like shot at as he's on his route or something or seeing other mailmen right. get executed. He's just out doing his job and it's too hard for him. I, I don't, I, I find that one generally, I find that semi insulting to the condition. It's like, oh, sure. what's yeah. the, what's the resolution? Like, what's even her problem? What's the resolution here? And then to snap of the fingers, is like that's that's your solution to fix this people who've suffered trauma in their past is just yeah. sit behind the desk and push the button and it's over I don't, I don't understand they are they are they do seem to be equating ptsd with like a fear of heights going into bungee jumping or something where yeah it's or like, it's well, that um the fear by exposure what's that therapy it's just like you just do yeah, it again yeah. and then you'll be fine right yeah yeah um which if this is supposed to be a ptsd analog yeah that's fairly insulting to people with ptsd just, like you, you gotta and, you grab know, these you know, stories yeah like i i don't have a problem with the idea of the story but it's just like 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 many other things on the show they put it out there and they don't do anything with it and then they just sort of dump it like i would be more interested if if detmer's ptsd played a bigger role somehow or they touched on it more or in, a, in a more interesting way um yeah i don't know I don't know what the answer because I mean, I, I it's tough though because like there's two ways you end that story, you either transfer her off the ship, or she gets over it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to make a choice, and they chose for her to get over it. I guess. Yeah, I I think those two story. I think her and Adira are the same thing where it's too, it's too realistic in some sense of a condition to portray mm. in a show like this because it just seems like it's the plot version of the Osira actress. It's just like you stuck a modern problem in here and you walk away going, why couldn't Culber help her? What, what's the problem? Right. Why, why yeah. can't anyone in the future help her? Why can't... This is a medically diagnosable brain damage issue, essentially. Like you, it's just... And I know you don't want to get into this weird spot where you're like, well, why don't they just fix everything with the transporter or something like this? This mm -hmm. magical realm that will destroy all narrative, but the, it's just too. She doesn't even talk to Culber once, right? She, well, I, well, she does. She has that. She has that sequence a couple episodes ago where she's doing jump rope or yoga or something, and Culber's like, "Are you okay?" And she goes, oh, right. yeah. "Yeah, yeah, I'll be okay." Right. Yeah, but she never talks about it. They never address it. They never no. turn it into a story. It's just he's spending his too much. He's spending all his time with Joe Zhao. And right who is which we should probably talk we haven't talked let's, about let's get out of the next episode is george out focused i'm just gonna fucking skip that episode i have no interest <laughs> in watching watching her the show is the show is going to turn her terran setup into some kind of emotional trauma made the terrans this way it's like Where's the metaphor? What, what the metaphor of the mirror universe is supposed to be that it's supposed to be a metaphor where it's just, you don't, you don't have midichlorians that tell you to be evil. You're just set up in a universe. that's yeah. totally backwards. And that's the way that everything is. Yeah. George Al makes I, no sense. The more you think about her, no sense. Yeah. Her constant zingers with Culber is driving me up a wall. She's like, I'm going to bite your children's heads off <laughs> as a result of getting a flu vaccination or something. Go ahead. She even, she has, she also has a, a meta, 
comeback where Culberus or or Burnham says like, "What are you going to do?" Blah blah blah, and she's like, "No, I'm going to make snarky comments and then give you a weird look and walk away." It's like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, we see the writers. We you've watched the show. <laughs> um, yeah, I I was thinking about this actually earlier today because I was listening to uh my uh, uh podcast called uh with Gorley and rust with uh comedians matt Gorley and paul rust where they talk about horror movies and they were talking about the remake of nightmare on elm street where one of the things that they do in that movie is they try to humanize freddy krueger a little bit more by making the child uh molesting and murdering aspect a lot more real and also which when we covered i thought that's what they should have done with freddy krueger yeah, actually I, I don't know if it works i don't yeah. think that it does um and one of the things they also do is they give you this red herring by implying that maybe freddy krueger was wrongfully murdered that's terrible that, that that's yeah. the that's the bad aspect i would assume yeah yeah and what and it, it got me thinking about it and i was like you know some bad guys can just be bad guys. Mm-hmm. Not everybody needs a tragic backstory that makes you like secretly love them. I don't Dracula doesn't need to be searching for his lost love in the form of Mina because she looks like his dead wife. It does, you don't have yep. to do that. Yep. Dracula can just be a vampire. You can have your own motivations. It doesn't make you less of a character if you're an evil person. Yep. As long as you can still write that character to be interesting, you don't need to it worked. It worked for Mister Freeze, where they gave him the uh, the uh, sympathetic backstory about his wife and everything. That works fantastic. I don't need that for every bad guy. Some bad guys are just bad guys. I don't need Freddy Krueger to be sympathetic. Yeah, some people I, are I just need, psychopaths. Yeah, and and even so, like with Freddy Krueger, he's a demon monster. I don't need him to have a sympathetic backstory. So I like mm-hmm. you want me to feel bad for Freddy Krueger? I, yeah, I don't. Um. And I think that with, well, I'm going to talk about that movie anymore, but um, it's with George Zhao. It's like uh, it seems like they're going so hard to try and get you to to like empathize with her, and it's like they're trying to get her to to get her onto the 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 light side, but they're not doing any work to do that. It's not like the the thi- It's not like she's interacting with the people on discovery and she's learning that oh maybe i don't need to be a space hitler anymore maybe i can be a space mussolini instead mm-hmm. and then you know work down the chain from there until you're a space mitch mcconnell and then eventually you leave the senate you're a nice <laughs> close enough um, but instead of doing that it seems like what they're going to do is give her this sympathetic backstory where she's got a dead son or some shit like that i guess it, i guess someone uh, there's a comment on youtube uh that was watching with subtitles. I guess she doesn't say son. I think she says something else like a name. That's what this person had told me anyway. Uh, so uh, it sounds like son. Does she, say, is, does she say sung? Is it possible she was just frustrated because she kept losing in Mortal Kombat? She just kept yelling <laughs> Shang Tsung? <laughs> Might have been yelling Soong. And it's uh, Dela who's going to make an appearance Ooh, in the sure, future. Sure, throw him in there. Why not? But like, yeah, it's like I, I do feel like to a point giving a evil character this sympathetic background is a really hacky way of writing a character because it doesn't it just it's just a it's just an it's cheap heat as they say in wrestling it it it, it this whole show is cheap heat that's all it is yeah. it's cheap heat yeah and um I, you can write it, it stops you from or or it, it it saves you from having to actually craft an interesting character who does interesting things organically by giving them a backstory where you go oh that makes sense you know i i get i get really tired of that stuff very quickly yeah i i think it's just antithetical to it's antithetical to the storytelling that you want to do although the discovery seems to want to do this it, it's just antithetical to the setup of the mirror universe is not it's not set up that way like if, so the implication here is that if you can slide one way it would seem that you could slide the other way right Mm -hmm. and if you if you had shown 
the Georgetown Mirror Universe, if you wanted to do that, has to involve the Mirror Universe, and it has to involve some characters from Discovery preferring the Mirror Universe at that point. If it's not going to be set up as a philosophical TOS era thing where it's just evil people, like it's just the opposite of what you are. And they're going to do it as some sort of sympathetic, sympathy for the devil type story. Uh, And I don't know... I don't know what that says. I mean, philosophically, what it says is that you should feel bad for a genocidal mass murderer because there is some small tragedy in the backstory. Mm -hmm. And it's understandable that everyone comes from somewhere. Like you're the sum of... Maybe she just didn't get into art school. (laughs) In this reality. Everyone's the sum of their experiences, right? Like the universe is deterministic and you become whatever feeds into you. And at that point, it is interesting to know where people come from because of the stories that got them there. I just don't think that the mirror universe is that character. That's not, it's not believable and it's not right for the story. And even if they nail this, I've gone into it not caring enough about George Al because she's a horrible, annoying character that's stuck in the show. And it's just going to make me roll my eyes. And the preview uh-huh. for next, next week looked terrible. It looks like 40 minutes of Kung Fu and a lot of, <laughs> a lot of crying. And I just, I don't know. Well, they're going to have to double up because there was no crying in this episode, which I was surprised about. There was very, yeah. very little, uh, intense emotions, which was oddly refreshing. <laughs> um, I do not know why they continued why they kept her on the ship into the jumping into the future. I don't understand it because she's been completely useless. Yeah. They've done yeah. nothing with her. Like it's a show. <laughs> I, I think the other thing that's really interesting about this show is they characters get short shrift because they just keep adding people to the ship. Mm. There's so late. They've added since the show started, they've added uh, evil George Ow, Jet Reno, Adira. Um, book. Book. The new blonde girl who took over for the robot that died. Yeah, Pike, the, the admiral. Pike, the admiral. Um, the girl with the oh, bar none. zoom. None, bar yeah. z- what are they? Bar Barzan. Barzan. With the you know the girl with the bar zooms. You know, <laughs> Baza um, zoom, Barza zans. Uh, it, it, like they just keep adding cat. You got Vance now. You, you've got. They just keep adding characters to the show, which means people get less and less screen time. Like I, I love that. I love that Detmer's been getting screen time because she. I actually know her name now because they got her doing stuff. But everybody else who's on that bridge, I know nothing about. I don't know the the uh, her friend there who sits on the other panel. I have no idea what her name is. Yeah, it's Osa 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 something. It's, it begins with an O. That's all I know. And uh, track. <laughs> Check over what the tweet out that they named the um the he's not tactical he's like communications or something the uh the mm-hmm. black male bridge character oh sure sure whose name is Ronald something he's got three names and I was just like this character has been named three names and they they show me the clip where this has happened so he has been named his full name in at least one episode but it just like I I. That's Discovery in a nutshell, really, the simplest. It's like, this character has three names. I didn't know his last name. It's like, I don't, I don't know what anyone would call him on, on a, a day-to-day basis, and that's yeah. it. Yeah, I just, it's, I think I think it's got too many characters, and too many, too many characters, especially, that they're pushing towards the front, um, and which means that none of them really get much time, because Michael has to be front and center at every story. Yep. Um. So if you're pushing Tilly and Saru and Stamets, Culber and Georgiou as basically like all secondary characters, then you get you're not getting a lot from anybody really. Which yeah. which is why the stuff they do do has to land more and it just it doesn't. We're done with the sanctuary. I, have, I will say, last thing. Mm-hmm. Uh I have not loved the season, but I have actually really, I thought that I, I continue to think that the Culber and Stamets scenes are generally very good. Like they, those two just have good chemistry with each other and they actually, it's at times where they actually have a chance to talk and stuff. And those, those scenes tend to be pretty good. Are you talking about the end scene here that I can, that's the only end scene. I, that's the only scene that would 
those two I can well, think you know, of. like the times, the times that when they've when they've talked about what Adira is has lost, and oh, so not just this episode, to, in, not in just general. this episode. No, I mean, okay. in the season in general, I continue, I, I continue to think Culber is the best character on the show. I think Culber and Saru. Yeah, we didn't even talk about Saru. I, I just, I like, I like this continuing story with Saru being this really like buttoned up square captain who doesn't really want to take any chances. Yeah, um, <laughs> but. You know, even there, you're not really getting a lot of uh, conflict out of it because he's put in this position where if he fires on Osiris, it's going to start a war. And then Detmer is like, well, what if I fly this ship out and do it instead? And he's like, yeah, sure. Why not? That's fine. And then that doesn't seem to work anyway, where she's like, right. I do it with you. I'm going to destroy the well, Federation. And that, he's like, I, It's one thing. The ship that attacks her comes out of Discovery. You yeah. know, it's it's not like the ship came in out of nowhere and just started blasting. And she's like, I don't understand any relationship between this thing and the Federation. It's like a, sh it's like if a shuttle launched off Discovery and then kamikazed her ship. Would would she be like, well, the Federation clearly didn't have anything to do with this. That was just a random right. shuttle. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. It's it's a th it's a thin argument at best. Yeah, and it doesn't, as you say, it doesn't work. It doesn't it doesn't matter. All right, that's it for The Sanctuary. It is the eighth episode of the third season. We're done with it. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. Let us know what you thought about The Sanctuary down below in the comments, or you can send an email. Uh, all the links and stuff will be down below. Thank you for supporting the show. If you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash The Penske File. A couple of those a month to get you extra stuff, extra podcasts, extra polls, extra uh, commentary tracks, blah, blah, blah. And occasionally I've been watching... Uh, watch parties on Amazon of old Star Trek episodes with people. So you can join that and do the chats as the episode runs, if you're interested, and the Discord, if you want to join the community over there on Discord. Clay, anything you want to say before we go? Uh, we had a new badass this week where we were talking about Riddler's Reform and Second Chance. To uh, Speaking of George Zhao going, going good, it's two episodes where Batman villains try to turn over a new leaf in various forms. And uh, next week we'll be doing... Oculus, mm -hmm. I think, right. for Rotten yeah. Horror Picture Show. I edit them far in advance, so I'm trying. To, I keep trying to remember the last one I listened. I think it's like two ahead of the one that's actually coming out or something. I think it is. Yeah, Oculus, and then uh, for Christmas week we'll be doing Black Christmas. Check out all those at thepenskyfile.com. All the other show, the Star Trek is at thepenskypodcast.com. Everything's on YouTube. Subscribe everywhere. Um, the next one is called Terra Firma Part One. So we got a two-parter coming up. Oh, geez. Is it going to be a two-parter about George Allen? <laughs> <laughs> Is it the same? It's the same writers. So there's potential. This was just too long of an episode for one, and they turned it into two. But we'll see. Um, anything else to say about this? Uh, I How do don't. you feel... How do you feel about this season at this point? Because like I said, we're over the halfway point. At this point, everything you would think should be kind of in place to to go into the, the last third or so. Right. Resolutions and have to start happening, not additions to yeah, the narrative. I don't really think that it is. I think this has been a terrible season. Um, mm -hmm. I think the show is terrible. Um <laughs> Tell us what you really think. I I get no like joy from this show. It feels like it's like I'm, when I have to watch the episode, I'm like, ah, fuck. Like, <laughs> I gotta sit down yeah. and watch this thing. Um, this season is weaker than the others just because of the lack of a spine to it, like lack of a narrative and probably like emotional spine is equally frustrating. Um, it's so disconnected. It's these small things that have done that have not really added up. Like the the commenter on YouTube from last week, I think Barbara uh, said that we started this season with the characters going, no one knows what caused the burn. There is no idea what did this. Then five episodes in, uh, Vance comes over and he's like, there's no, we have no idea what happened with the burn. Actually, the Vulcans, we think the Vulcans did it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And this is well known. And so the show never makes you feel like it's confident and it believes in what it's telling you. So you never have this time to put faith into what they're telling you because you're like, well, they're probably just going to change this in two episodes. So 
why pay attention to any of it? And it's really unsatisfying. And it makes it seem like they just, they write it from, they shoot from the hip and they just kind of like scrawl out what they're going to do. And there's no sort of outlining or thought about what the season is supposed to be. And you forget about things like that Vance thing, but it's fundamental to it. it it's fundamental to this is the setup of the mystery. It's either no mm-hmm. one knows or we have a lot of ideas about what happened with the burn. Let's explore them and see why none of them are right and why something else is the actual solution. And when you combine the two, it just seems like you have no idea what you're doing and no idea yeah. where you want to go. They're treating the burn as though like I lost my keys. You know, it's like I can't find my keys. And then that one person who just got to your house goes, oh, here they are. You know, right. Oh, cool. Oh, they're um, always the last place you look, aren't they? It's yeah, just, it's just... the last black box you expect them to be. Um, no one's obsessed with the spore drive in this universe. That's the it makes thing. no that's sense. That's driving me nuts. Like yeah. I was saying this on, on the Discord. I have no idea why in a story where your setup is we don't have faster than light travel anymore because all the dilithium blew up and the Vulcans have been working on an alternative, which we think is what caused the burn to happen. So that's a big deal. No one bats an eye at the spore drive. There's been no question or no attempt from the Federation to be like, can we make a couple more of these things? Mm -hmm. Like when they go to Vulcan, they're like, yeah, we see that you had a spore drive. Cool. The Emerald Chain is not obsessed with getting the spore drive no. from them. It's a steel discovery. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, do they even know they have it? Like, this would have been a great point. Cause I, I thought maybe the second half of the season would have been something like that, where it's like, okay, now the spore drive and, and controlling that technology would be the power thing play. that's being yeah. yeah, would be the power play. Especially if the whole thing now with the Syra is that she's running out of dilithium. You'd think she'd be in the market for something that she could control. Still like time for that to happen, I guess. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. But the fact that no one has batted an eye that this ship from the past showed up and solved all their problems. And someone on the Discord was saying, well, I don't know, maybe they can't rebuild it. Adir rebuilt the damn interface in like 25 <laughs> minutes. Yeah, yeah. You're telling me, and it's 100 years in the future. That's like saying, oh, we they're, can't They're 1,000 years from Spore Sorry, technology. Sorry, 1,000 yeah. years. Yeah, they're, they're 1,000 years in the future. We can't rebuild this Viking ship because we don't know the technology of wooden hands. We, we, we don't have the exact yeah. tree that they were using right. back, back yeah. then. We don't yeah. have the exact, all those trees are gone from Iceland. We can't build this ship anymore. It's like, <laughs> well, you know what you do have now is like synthetic materials. Anyway, yeah. but you know, my point is, I think it would be reasonable to assume that they would be able to figure out how to repurpose this thing. Yeah. It I, blows I'd my be, mind. They have no, they haven't even talked about it. It would be the no most, one has unbel- mentioned it. most unbelievable Star Trek thing if they could not replicate the spore drive. It, because yeah, and Stamets invented the goddamn thing. He's the one right. of the key scientists who built it. Like you think that he, uh, where's the Stamets gets kidnapped and tortured by the Emerald Chain storyline? Or until, <laughs> what, how come Vance hasn't pulled him aside or something and been like, hey, you know. The Federation could use a whole bunch of these things. Michael Burnham's been acting kind of crazy. I don't think you want to be with Team Crazy. You should be with Team Vance. Like, let's let's yeah, give you a it, nice apartment. And I just, I, it's, they're, I don't know how to describe it because they are caught in this, I still think they're caught in this weird um, nebula between uh, serialized stuff and episodic stuff. And they haven't figured out really how to reconcile it. Whereas on The Mandalorian, the most recent episode of Mandalorian, it Mandalorian has this kind of like, I, I think I said before, it's like playing fetch with a dog kind of structure where it's like, oh, you get the ball, you throw the ball. It's fun to watch the dog go get the ball. He brings it back. Next episode is the same thing. Eventually, though, you there's a good move tweet. Sorry, there's a, a good tweet. The the Mandalorian can't go to his fridge for a glass of milk without getting stuck in a side quest. <laughs> somewhere. Yes. yes. That kind of I thing. also saw somebody else to say that uh, this is a different conversation, but uh, that the the mandalorian is a show entirely about a side character so which is why it seems like he's always just on the fringe of stories is because he's got his own thing going on he's always he's the guy who's going to come in to the main story and help you out and then leave but you're just following that guy right yeah uh, which is an interesting take um but anyway my point is even mandalorian on the most recent episode that came out today they took a big step forward in moving their story forward in a way that at this point in their season, you have to do something like this. Uh, Discovery has not done that. There is, they have not taken that turn in their story. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure why. I think it's because they don't know what the main story is. There's no, 
they've got five things going on and none of them are like the main story the story yeah 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 what do you think about the season so far uh i thought it started with a lot of potential but yeah i i think this has been way more messy than the past at least I, it's been too long since i've watched the first one but the second season i think held together a lot better than this one does yeah yeah i would agree we'll call it i mean at least in season two they were taking chances narratively whether or not i thought they worked is up for debate but yeah. like they have taken almost no chances whatsoever in the season and it shows yeah yeah all right we're done thank you very much for listening everybody we hope you enjoyed our whinging and we'll see you next week with the next episode of uh star trek discovery which is terra firma part one see ya <laughs>